Hi, my name is Jonathan Hicks and I'm back at the Vice Cup. This evening I'm joined by... Amy. Matt. Jack. Steve. And we've just finished playing Hex Roller, which is a roll and write. And on, when it's your turn, you take all the dice and you roll them. The colours, incidentally, don't matter for anything, but essentially, uh, you're trying to pick numbers. Uh, Jack, do you fancy just grouping these for me? So they're going to get grouped according to the numbers, and you're picking two groups. So I could pick the group of sevens and the group of fours, even though there's only one four. And then you have to write the numbers in the grid here. Now, you can see there's some kind of pre-printed numbers, like the four, the three, and the eight, and things. So if I were to take the sevens, for example, then I'd have to write the sevens next to a, an existing pre-printed seven. And then every seven you do after that has to be next to the previous one you've written down. So I could write seven, then seven, then seven. Uh, but you couldn't kind of write one, so I couldn't do a six here, for example, and then a six here. They've got to be next to each other. And essentially, you're just trying to fill up the grid. Uh, so as I say, you take two groups, the next person rolls the dice, then everyone simultaneously is always taking two groups. So even if I take the sevens, someone else can take the sevens as well. That's fine. Uh, and then at the end of the game, you're scoring down the side here uh, for points in different sections. If you complete a section, then you get whatever the biggest, like the number that occurs the most is in this section, you get that many points. So I've got more sixes than anything else in that section, so that section scores me six points. So you count each of the sections like that. The one in the middle is worth double points, so I've actually got more sevens than anything else, so I got 14 points for that one. And then you're also trying to connect the numbers. So in this case, you can see the existing printed three I connected to the other three here, like a trail of threes, so that got me three points. Uh, but if you manage to kind of connect the eight somehow all the way across the board to the other eight, then you'd get an extra eight points for that. And then also, each time you take the numbers, so let's say I was just saying I took the seven and the four, you'd write the numbers in here. So on my first turn, you can see I took a three and an eight, and then it was Amy's turn, let's say, and I took the eight and the four. So these are all the numbers you've taken. And at the end of the game, you look to see, have you got a three? And if you've got a three, then you look for a four. I've got a four, then a five, and then a six. Do I have a seven? No. So it's the highest number that you kind of get to counting up from three. So in this case, I'd get six points. Write it in there. You do the same thing here. So I've got three, yes, four, five, six, oh, seven, eight. I've got all of them. Incidentally, the dice don't have any ones or twos. They go from three to eight for some strange reason. So in this case, because I go all the way up to eight, I get to write eight in. You actually double that one, add up your score, and most points wins. And one other thing is you've got these sort of special abilities. So once in the game, you can take an extra dice, if you like. So if I took the three sevens, I could cross this off to make it four sevens. You can cross that off to write a random two in here. You maybe you need to fill up a section. And this lets you take an extra group. So instead of taking just two groups, you could take a third group on one particular turn. All right, what do we think? I don't really like it that much. It's not a game that I would probably choose ever to play. It the the turns don't really matter. It doesn't matter who rolls the dice, and that's quite off-putting because it doesn't give me something special that I can do above what the other players can do in any sense. Like I can't re-roll them. I can't choose digits that take things away from other people so theoretically I could end up with exactly the same board as somebody else at the end of the game and yeah of course your decisions are probably going to be different but it doesn't make it very exhilarating to play and I know roll and rights aren't the most sort of fun in that regard but it doesn't really do anything for me personally okay Matt so yeah, we've been playing a lot of roll and rights. Um, I've only played this once just now. Um, and I think, uh, like Amy says, there's nothing you can do as the active player, which does make this the fairest of the roll and rights, because obviously in all the others, if you happen to roll better than anyone else on your turn, you're gonna win, because you've got better numbers than everyone else. Whereas in this, everyone's got the same numbers, and so it's, it's fairer, um, but like Amy, I'm not instantly enamored with it. Um, I think I think it's fine, but there are better roll mics, I think. Okay. Jack? It's, it's all right. It's, it's definitely more fun when you're winning than <laughs> being dead last. Um, I found that uh, there's a bit of a problem with it's all entirely random, the dice rolls, which in other games is often a form of wild dice, um, and that lets you manipulate in even the slightest way what sort of direction you want to take your game. I went for the, that long eight path that Jonathan mentioned, and I think a total of four eights came out throughout the entire game, um, which got me nowhere near, and that ruined all the rest of my board. Uh, so it was, it was okay. Okay. <laughs>
Okay. Steve? There's a bit to think about. It wasn't like there was an instant obvious move for everyone's turn. There were people slowly thinking it. But they've kind of mentioned it briefly that you need to be able to do something on someone else's turn effectively. There were no there were no turns in this game. There's no reason for well Jonathan could roll the dice every time. You could play this by yourself and have exactly the same sort of game as if you're playing with up to eight people. There's no reason why this doesn't play twenty people. You could all just do the same thing, you know, you shout out on a megaphone, this is what we've rolled guys, take your turn. Um, so a bit like so so like if you compare it to Karuba, Karuba is almost identical. Karuba you can have any number of play counts, but Karuba, the first person to get to the temple, will get more points. Here, if the first person to connect the threes together got the three points and no one else did, there'd be an incentive to try and race for one of those kind of bonuses to do that. Um, there's no there's no distinguishing difference between a one-player game and an eight-player game in this game, and so it feels like a definitely a multiplayer solitaire. Uh, the only thing is you all dra you're all using the same numbers, so certain times when, like in this particular case, if you roll a lot of eights and you try direct strategy, you can score quite high, but you need to roll those eights. So apart from Apart from that, you could just play this solo player and you get exactly the same amount of joy out of it. Rating? Four and a half. Four. I'd give it a five. Three. <laughs> okay. It is the very definition of multiplayer solitaire. It really doesn't matter what anyone else is doing, and as Steve says, you know, anyone could roll the dice. It's an interesting puzzle, I think. You know, I've played it a few times, and it's like the first time I had it quite badly, and I was like, oh, okay, I need to put my numbers here and put my numbers here. Connecting the numbers together is quite important in the way you snake them around other numbers. So that's interesting enough, but yeah, for, as the, for the issues they've kind of talked about, um, it's not a great roll and write, but it's fine. I'd be on a 5 out of 10. All right, thanks for watching. That was Hex Roller.